Hi guys, welcome to Unit 5, Notes 1b. Today we're going to look at Enthalpies of Bonds and Hess's Law. In Honors Chemistry, we looked at a lot of different ways to determine the enthalpy or heat change. One thing we haven't looked at yet is how to determine that from the breaking and formation of bonds during a chemical reaction, the bond enthalpies. To get us started, let's look at the bond enthalpy for a diatomic molecule. Remember, these are molecules which would naturally occur as a pair in nature. So in this equation, X and Y would represent two separate oxygen atoms in a bond, whereas this reaction represents an equilibrium where they produce the free radicals on the right-hand side of the equation. One of the most important things to notice about this process is that all of the substances are in gas molecules. As we move forward and look at other bond enthalpies, you're going to see that continues to be an important part of the process. Because the free radicals on the right-hand side are so unstable, this equilibrium heavily favors the reactants, and that's all we tend to see in nature. In honors chemistry, we essentially ignored this equilibrium and focused only on the diatomic molecule. And we used to refer to this energy in this bond as stored energy. However, that's really not the best characterization. In order to determine that bond enthalpy, we have to look at the breaking and forming of bonds and the energy required to do so. All right, so breaking bonds makes a positive delta H. It is an endothermic process. And forming bonds is a negative delta H, an exothermic process. And that really does make sense if you think about why elements bond. The goal is to complete the octet. And so they're bonding because it is more stable. So if we're going to break the bond, we're going to decrease the stability, well that requires energy. Now if you're going to make something more stable, like going to the ground state, that's going to be a release of energy, and so you're going to get the negative delta H. In order to get the delta H, or the enthalpy of an entire reaction, we can look at a formula one of two ways. Essentially we need to add up or sum all of the bonds that are broken and subtract all the bonds that are formed. This subtraction is representative of the negative delta H. So another way you may see this in a more conceptual context is to just sum up all of the bonds where the bonds that are formed are negative since they're exothermic. And you can see mathematically how this is essentially the same thing. One word of caution is if you are going to use the first formula where it has the subtraction already for you, then don't start overthinking the negative delta H and subtract a negative, which of course would make a positive and get you the wrong answer. Most of the work we're going to do with calculating bond enthalpies will be in context to organic compounds. So this is the table that's given um, in your notes and in your IB data booklet to be used on the actual test, like your IB test for next year. So have this handy when you're calculating bond enthalpies. These are where the numbers are going to be pulled from. Anytime you have single bonds, double bonds, or triple bonds of either carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, or any combination thereof. For our first reaction, we're going to calculate the enthalpy of the hydrogenation of ethene, which sounds so fancy, but we can break this down. We know what ethene is. It's going to have two carbons. And then because it's a ENE -E double bond, and then to saturate it, it would be attached to two hydrogens. Hydrogenation or hydrogenization, however you want to say it, just means that we're adding hydrogen, which we know always comes as a diatomic molecule. Now with these extra hydrogens, we do not need the double bond. Each carbon can have three hydrogens. So we get our single bonded ethane as a product. So here I want to pick up again, I just added the hydrogens so that we could see the carbon-hydrogen bonds a little more clearly. And then I mentioned before, everything has to be as a gas, so I wanted to put that in as well. So now what I want to go through and do is make a list of all the bonds broken and all the bonds formed. So let's look at the bonds that need to be broken on the reactant side. First we have this carbon-to-carbon -carbon double bond. And then we have a carbon-to-hydrogen bond. One two, three, four times. So four carbon-hydrogen bonds. And then we also, on my other reactant, have a hydrogen to hydrogen bond. And so I want to look at what those numbers are 
the carbon, nope, not triple bond, double bond, this one, is 612. Then the carbon-hydrogen bond is the third one down, 412. But keep in mind, we have four of those. And then hydrogen to hydrogen is the first one at 436. So I want to total all this up and see what my total enthalpy of the broken bonds are. And we get 2,696. Next, let's look, let's look at the bonds that we're going to form. So bonds formed on the product side was a carbon-carbon single bond, a carbon-hydrogen bond, but this time the carbon-hydrogen bond occurs six times, and that's it. There are no other products. So my carbon-carbon single bond is 348, and then my carbon-hydrogen bond, the same here, of 412, but this time six times. Let's see what our total is on the formation of bonds. And so we get 2,820. But because those are bonds formed, that is a negative 2,826. So when we combine the bonds broken and bonds formed, we will get our total enthalpy. Or you can think of it as broken minus form formed. So either way, we're doing 26 minus 28. So while I was doing my math there, I realized a math mistake. The answer for the formed should be negative 2,820, and then the total enthalpy we get is a negative 124. And then the units are usually on top of the table. They are on your note takers. That is kilojoules per mole, or an IB speak KJ mole to the negative one. Final answer. I know that the touchscreen handwriting is not the best, so here is everything nice and typed out. So you can see the Lewis structures and the bonds energy that's used to break and form in the blue and the red there. And then you can see the subtraction method on this slide. And now on this slide, you can see where they're treated just as the exothermic um, from the bonds formed and then added. Same math wise, still get negative 124 kilojoules per mole. Let's try another example. This time we're gonna look at combustion of something called hydrazine. This equation can be found in the reading if you're looking for it. Basically, we're gonna react N2H4 with the oxygen, combustion meaning react with oxygen, and then we're gonna produce nitrogen gas and water. The one thing you should know about hydrazine is that it uses an incomplete octet. So each of these nitrogens is attached to a hydrogen, but only a single bond between the nitrogens. It's important to have the correct Lewis structure so you know whether you should be using single, double, or triple bonds. For the O2 and the N2, you should be able to get those Lewis structures on your own. Oxygen always has a double bond, and then nitrogen always a triple bond. And then with the regular water structure, which we've also drawn several times. So I just wanted to take a second to rewrite that and I tried, but I couldn't get this phase into all of them on the, the way that I'm writing this by hand on the size. But every single one of these molecules would need to be in the gas phase to use these numbers. All right, so now let's look at what the bonds are that were broken on the reactant side, our broken bonds. We have the nitrogen to nitrogen bond, a single bond because we have the incomplete octet. Then nitrogen to hydrogen occurs four different times. So we have four NH bonds. And then we have this double bonded oxygen, O double bonded O. Now let's look at what's on the formed side. So what new bonds do we have on the products? We have a triple bonded nitrogen. And then we have a hydrogen to oxygen bond. But how many we have is actually kind of the tricky part. Each water molecule has two hydrogen to oxygen bonds, but then there's two total. So actually there's four hydrogen to oxygen bonds in my product. Now let's take a second to pull up all of the numbers from the table and match them to these bonds that are formed. 
So here we have the energies that were associated with the bonds that were formed and the energies that were associated with the bonds that were broken. Now we need to get these subtotals. So I got a total of 2,211 kilojoules per mole that were broken and in the formed side, 2,796 kilojoules per mole. So now we just have to do broken minus formed or consider that the bonds formed are exothermic. So just not both, one or the other, we're gonna be doing 2,211 minus 2,796 to get our final answer. And so the final answer is negative 585 kilojoules mole to the negative one. And just in case that was hard to read, again, here I have the work shown with the correct Lewis structures, the summation of the bonds, and doing the formula as the uh, bonds broken minus the bonds formed. And here you can see that we've created the exothermic or the negative delta H on the bonds formed and then added them. Same thing, we're still getting negative 585. So there are two important limitations for you to be aware of if you are using bond enthalpies to calculate the enthalpy of the reaction. One thing that I mentioned on those last two examples is that the reactants and products all need to be gases. Everything needs to be a gas for these values to be accurate. The other thing is that we're assuming that all molecules are created equal, and they're not. The reality is that neighboring atoms do affect compounds. And so depending on what other parts of the molecule there are, there might be a slightly higher or lower enthalpy depending on the different molecules. No two carbon to carbon bonds are necessarily exactly the like unless they are surrounded by exactly the same things. So those are the main two things that prevent us from having truly accurate delta H of reaction values from using only bond enthalpy calculation. Now let's start going into Hess's law, and before we bring bond enthalpies into Hess's law, I want to start with a little bit of review from the way we saw Hess's law in ninth grade. So, delta H of reaction is going to be the total of the enthalpy of each step of the reaction. So even if the reaction as a whole has to go through an intermediate first, we can just add up all of the steps and then we'll get the delta H of the total reaction. So this is what one of these problems would look like. We have step one and step two, which need to total this equation where we don't know the enthalpy. So I like to set this up like addition. I want equation one plus equation two to equal my third final equation here, which is N2O2 forming NO. The first thing that I would do is try to make sure I have reactants on the reactant side and products on the product side. So the very first thing I check, I see a problem. Nitrogen does not exist on the reactant side anywhere. It's over here on the product side. So that tells me I'm going to have to flip equation one. When we flip the equation, we also have to flip the sign of the delta H. So that is now a positive enthalpy for that reaction. I do have oxygen on the correct side, and I do have NO on the correct side. So, so far I at least have everything where I want it. The next thing that I want to look for is anything that will cancel out. So I have four ammoniums on either side, and I have six waters on either side. So those will cancel out completely. I have three oxygens on the right and five on the left, so that will fit, simplify down to two on the left. And then what I am left with as a whole is two nitrogens, two oxygens, and four NOs. But I wanted one to one to two. I currently have two to two to four. So what that tells me is that I now need to divide my final equation by two. I need to first solve for the delta H by combining equations one and two's delta H's, and then I'll be able to cut that delta H in half. So using Hess's law, when we combine steps one and two, we get a positive 360 kilojoules to get twice of everything. And then if we cut that in half, we get our final answer of 180 kilojoules per mole. And it is positive, so it's endothermic. 
And again, just in case any of that was hard to read, here it is um, all typed up. Next, we're going to look at a completely different way to write Hess's Law. And big surprise, being IV, we're going to look at this more graphically in terms of something called an energy cycle. We're going to look at how reactants kind of flow and can form intermediates that flow back into um, the products in which they would have gotten from a direct reaction. And the key is that it is really independent of the path of the reaction. So if it's a one step, a 15 step, a three step, doesn't matter how many steps, if the products are the same, the reactants are the same, then the enthalpy should total the same. So this is the general setup for an energy cycle. First you're going to see reaction path A through B, the direct formation of forming compound B from compound A is H1. Now that energy should be exactly the same as if A forms C first, H2, and then C forms B, H3. C would be what we call an intermediate. And even though H1 is only one step, and H2 and 3 going through the intermediate is two steps, because the reactant and product are the same, that should be equal energy. I thought writing it out this way it might help it make a little bit more sense in context of the way we're used to seeing things as equations adding up. This would represent A going to C, and then C going to B. The fact that C is produced in step one, used up in step two, is what makes it an intermediate. And then your net reaction is going from A to B. So that total final enthalpy should be the same as the addition of the enthalpies of H2 and H3 to total the final enthalpy. 2 plus 3 should be the same as 1. As you may notice, Hess's law basically comes from the law of conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, so even though it may take an extra step to go through um, a transition, it's still the same amount of energy overall. One advantage of looking at Hess's law this way is that we can also work backwards. We aren't always solving for the final equation. We can also look back at individual steps. Because sometimes it's actually the steps, like a step two or step three from before, that's harder to measure, and we can get the final steps. So let's look at our first energy cycle. In this energy cycle, it says that we have two reactions which can be easily measured directly. Those are in the yellow and the green. The things that can be measured directly are typically not written at the top of the energy cycle. The top of the energy cycle is going to be the thing that cannot be easily measured. That's where your delta H unknown is going to be. So then we can connect the sides between which reactants can form one of the products and then how the product could be used as an intermediate, allowing this other measurable reaction to lead us to the unknown reaction. Only for this very first energy cycle am I going to write it out as we used to in honors chem, just to try to help you follow what's going on here. The very first reaction with the unknown delta H is going to represent the very first step in our Hess's Law equation, where we do not know the delta H. So it's always written at the top of the energy cycle with the unknown delta H, but it's only going to represent one of the steps. And that's because we would need a second step to get to the end product, to go through the unknown, through the intermediate, and get over to this carbon dioxide final product. So this would be the reaction where CO plus half an O2 produces the CO2, and the given delta H is the negative 2H3. So that's how you read a leg of an energy cycle. The reactants are actually written along the arrows, as well as the enthalpies. Then we have our final equation of this Hess's Law where it gives the final delta H. So this is read from the carbon reacting with the O2 molecule to form CO2. So this leg of the cycle represents the final equation where there is a direct delta H.
why these energy cycles are useful is because it can help us solve for a leg. In this case, we don't know the delta H of the carbon turning into the CO. So we can now use basically solving for X, where we know that the addition of these first two legs of the reaction should equal the total leg. So we've got this negative 393 that's going to be equal to the unknown delta H and the negative 3, I'm sorry, 283. And so solving for X there, we get the delta H of the unknown, which is a negative 110 uh, kilojoules. The thing is, the IB questions are not going to give you the equations. They're going to give you the energy cycle. So you have to get used to reading it. Now let's look at an example where we have to create our own energy cycle. In this example, we are going to calculate the enthalpy change for one mole of methane being formed from elements in their standard states. And then the second sentence gives us some information about enthalpies of combustion. I'm going to save that for step two. This first sentence is all we need to write our equation for the enthalpy change. This will be the equation at the top of the energy cycle. Our delta HX always goes at the top of the energy cycle. So if I'm trying to form methane, form methane, methane is going to go on the product side, CH4. Now I need to figure out what the standard states are from the elements that combine it, the C and the H, carbon and hydrogen. Carbon is not diatomic and typically comes as a solid. Hydrogen is diatomic and would come as a gas. Those are their standard states. Methane also is a gas in its standard form. And then you would write your delta H on top of that arrow there. I didn't quite leave enough room, um, but that's what we typically would write out for the equation on the top of the um, energy cycle. I do want to make a quick comment on the fact that this carbon is a solid, even though we've talked so much about how things need to be a gas. And that is okay because the enthalpy of combustion for the standard state of carbon would be for the combustion of that naturally existing solid. So this Hess's Law question is a little bit different because it's not using bond enthalpies, it's using enthalpies of a reaction. The next question asks us to start putting together our energy cycle using the fact that our products are the products of combustion. So if you look at the second sentence of the given example question, like the base question up here, then we can see we were given three enthalpy of combustion energies. So what would those energies correspond to? Let's think about what equations we're going to need to embed into our um, energy cycle. Let's think about carbon first. We know these are the enthalpies of combustion, and we know a little bit about combustion, right? So if I'm writing carbon combustion, that'll be for carbon reacting with oxygen the product of which would simply be CO2. So for this particular equation, I know that the enthalpy delta H is the first, because it says respectively, meaning in order, the first enthalpy of negative 393 kilojoules per mole. Now let's look at hydrogen. So if hydrogen goes through combustion, reacting with oxygen. It turns out that both the hydrogen and the oxygen are diatomic, but their product would be water. So on this one, it does not come out balanced. As it turns out, we would need two waters to balance the oxygen, and then we'd need two hydrogen molecules as well. So this is my balanced equation. However, these enthalpies are per mole. And here I have produced two moles of water. So you can think of this as one of two ways. This particular equation has a delta H of two times the negative 286, or we could cut it in half, H2 half an O2 to form the one mole of water. And then we have the given enthalpy of just the negative 286. So, kind of important to keep both of those things in mind for now. We'll have to see which one we need 
in the actual energy cycle. Now let's look at our last one, the methane going through combustion with our last enthalpy given. So methane is our CH4, and going through combustion means we're gonna react it with O2. And the products of any hydrocarbon combustion would be CO2 and H2O. And it's delta H will be negative 890 kilojoules per mole. Oh, actually didn't, I just caught something here. To balance the hydrogens, we would need two water molecules. So that's our final equation there. So here you have it all together. These are the three enthalpies for the three equations that were given in this last sentence. And now our job is to be able to put these equations into an energy cycle as opposed to writing them out as these equations. The first thing you do to construct an energy cycle is put the equation with the unknown enthalpy at the top. So carbons are gonna react with two of the hydrogens in order to form the methane, CH4. And that is the delta H we do not know, which is delta HX. The next thing we're gonna look at are some different pathways. So we looked at combustion. We looked at reacting both, or actually all three, carbon, hydrogen, and the methane, all with oxygen. So there's a pathway of carbon reacting with oxygen, a pathway of hydrogen reacting with oxygen, and then a pathway of methane reacting with oxygen. These are the three equations that we just discussed. Carbon reacting with oxygen produced CO2. Hydrogen reacting with oxygen produced water. And then methane reacting with oxygen produced both water and carbon dioxide. So this is the basic nuts and bolts of our carbon cycle. Now we wanna add whatever energies we can in considering we have the given enthalpies, which we had associated with the previous equations. So the methane one and the carbon one are simple. I'm gonna go ahead and put those in. The negative 890 went with the methane, and the negative 393 went with the carbon. But remember there was a catch with the water, because this is the enthalpy for only one mole of water, when really we formed two moles of water. And the balanced reaction with the methane actually should have had the two to balance the hydrogens from the methane as well. So for either way, going from hydrogen or from methane, we form two waters. So it really makes the most sense to go ahead and consider the enthalpy as two times negative 286. Because the um, energy form used here would be to form two moles of water, whereas the 286 is just for one mole of water. And here is your cycle, just a little less messy. Now let's talk about which routes are supposed to be equal. How can we apply Hess's law? If we're starting with the reactants, carbon and hydrogen, and trying to get to the products, CO2 and H2O, then there are mainly two ways we can do that. One would be to go through combustion separately with carbon and hydrogen to create two separate reactions that individually produce carbon dioxide and H2O, and that would be what they're calling the direct route. The other way would be going through the unknown reaction to create methane, and then going through combustion with methane and the hydrocarbon uh, combustion being responsible for producing both the CO2 and the H2O. The outcome of either is the same and they start from the same reactants. So the blue routes, the direct routes, and those purple indirect routes that go through methane should um, be a total of equal energy. The total of the direct routes should equal the total of the indirect routes. Going through this extra molecule which is called our intermediate. So now we can essentially set up an equation where we put the two routes equal to each other. And then we're gonna plug in the enthalpies that we have for each of the legs of the cycle. 
So first, plugging in negative 393 for the combustion of carbon. Then plugging in twice the negative 286 for the combustion of hydrogen, since we would combust two moles of it to produce two moles of water, or use two moles of it going through the methane in order to produce two moles of water. So either way, we need double that as, um, enthalpy of combustion. Then on the other side of the equation, we have the unknown enthalpy, delta Hx. And then we're going to plug in our enthalpy of carbon, which is minus B890. So now we just need to solve for our enthalpy of delta Hx. And we get our final answer to be the enthalpy of formation is a negative 75 kilojoule mole to the negative 1. And I did leave out my units above here. They would have all been kilojoule per mole as given. I just kind of was short on room. So there we go, final answer, negative 75. And here it is all typed out in case you need to be able to see it a little better. And that will do it for unit five, notes B1. There is a continuation of notes B that focuses specifically on the ozone bond enthalpies. So we'll pick that up next time.